you know, the wrong image will stop you from getting to your de destiny in life. God wants you to take that next step to the next level. And you must understand that it's important for you to know your image. Now, today you can get this CD absolutely free. All you have to do is call the number on the screen right now. Operators are waiting on your phone call. They're going to send you out this CD absolutely free. We want to put this in your hand. We want to be a blessing to you. So call the number on the screen right now. Operators are waiting on your phone call, and they'll be able to send this out absolutely free. Now, the title of today's lesson is Multiplication is Determined on How You Look at Yourself. Now, remember that. Now, when you call, let them know that you want today's lesson, and they will send it out to you absolutely free. Now, let's go back into the message already in progress, and I'll be right back to pray for you in just a moment. Now, we're going to deal with this because this is so important. Well, Pastor, why do you want to talk about the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man? Because e you are either one of these. Got it? And Either one is going to determine what you're going to get from God. See, most people assume that we get things from the natural man uh, from, uh, in the natural man state from God. We can't get anything from the natural man in the state. And some people believe we can get it even from the carnal. But see, what happens is if I don't know the definition or the definition or the abbreviation of something, I then have to assume something. What we're going to do is we're going to clear up what natural man means because you hear it said a lot you know you hear the natural man the natural man and then you hear carnal man said a lot so what we want to do today is explain it to us let us get it in our spirit and then let us walk out of it and stay in the spiritual man amen so let's look at this all right all right number one go over to first corinthians chapter two now as you get over there once you get there say i'm there and then i'm going to give you my definition of the natural man the natural man is born into a human family and lives in his natural state without being a child of God. All right? Now, I'll say it again. The he's born into a human family and lives in his natural state without being a child of God. So now, we have a natural man. So a natural man is everyone. Everybody was a natural man at one time before you were born again. Got it? So all others are, if you're not born again today, if you're not saved, you are a natural man well well pastor well, I said, no gotta understand now why is that important the reason why that's important because we're going to find something in second first corinthians chapter two now i want you to write this down remember that nothing god does or says makes sense to the natural man it doesn't make sense to the natural man i'll say it again remember that nothing god does or says makes sense to the natural man are, are you following me now now, and so a lot of us are dealing with this natural man. And when you're dealing with this natural man, you try to explain to somebody else, you try to talk to them, and they don't even understand why you do what you do. They're looking at you like, my God, you know, why you go to church? Why you giving? Why you serve? They have no idea that it's a spiritual connection. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now watch this. Now go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. Let me prove this. Are you there, class? Ready? Now read. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. See, even though a natural man can read and has education and can read the Bible, the challenge that they have is, is that they're still only, only learning or being able to interpret by their senses. There are five senses. That's, that's, they're limited. They're limited by their sight. They're limited by what they hear. They're limited by their fleshly reason. So, they, so for, for them, coming to church and listening to the word doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't commute to them. They're like, oh, why? why? It, it, because, once again, the natural man, that's the natural man. Now, let me read it in the NLT version. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I'll read this to you. Verse 14 says, but people who are spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolishness to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. <laughs> See? They, they can only understand what the Spirit means. Right? Now, now watch this now. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Now write this down now. 
The natural man tries to understand God with his five senses. The natural man tries to understand God with his five senses. I told you first that he, the reason why he can't, because he trusts five senses. Now I'm trying to tell you, he tries to understand with his five senses. So he's trying to see it. He's trying to comprehend it in his mind, but it's, it's, it's kind of confusing to him. It's almost like the first time you came to church and you really heard the word being preached to you. You're kind of like they're sitting there like, hmm, what this is this about? See, it's not because you're a bad person. It's primarily because of the natural part of you. You just, you just, it's just, you're not born again. And so, let's keep going a little bit further since y'all like that real good. <laughs> the natural man, the wisdom, and I put that, the wisdom of, of the world receives not the things of the spirit. Now, I'll say it again. The natural man has the wisdom of the world and receives not the things of the spirit. See, a natural man, he has the wisdom of the world or wise in the world, but he, doesn't have, he can't receive the spiritual things of God. Because, see, what happens is that natural man blocks out the spirit of God with all of the information that he received either through experiences, either through his education or his background, whatever he has. He has then, he, he, has, he, said, he has said to himself or herself that I value this more than I value the word. Are you with me? So it's a fight. It's a fight. It's a fight. So that's the natural man. Let's, let, me, let me go one more. <laughs> the natural man... <laughs> it's difficult to be corrected. Thank you for the overwhelming excitement. See, when, when you try to correct the natural man, the natural man always goes back to what they have learned and then defute you by discrediting you. Y'all will catch this in a minute. See, what a natural man does. A natural man, let me show you how natural it is. Y'all don't do this. I know y'all don't do this here, but, but, you know, hey, how you doing? Good to meet you, man. Hi, hey, where you work at? So we ask them where they work, what they do, because that identifies them. See, if I go over there and say, well, what, what did you do? See, you say, well, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a car, uh, car well, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, what, what's the, what's the car came pick us up? Uh, um, no, not sure for no one to show up with an Uber. I'm an Uber driver. I told them the other day I'm going to be an Uber driver. They said, Pastor, I can only imagine I'm going to vex you all. Uber driver, man, pick people up. Hey, what's up? Pastor! See, yeah, I'm making this paper. I put a tip in there too now. <laughs> but see, a lot of times when you take where you work or what you do, they size you up. See, that's natural man. The natural man size you up. Because they look at, okay, where you work at, they say, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I know what your education is. You know, they, they, they size you up. You, don't, you may don't know that, but that's what they're doing. Got it? See, that's what the natural man, the Bible says, the natural man looks at the outer, but God weighs the spirit. See, the natural man always looks at the outer part and justifies it. So you have to be, you have to be mindful that when you try to correct the natural man, the natural man immediately try to discredit you. By seeing shortcomings in you to say, you can't give me instruction. Because that justifies him to stay the same. Thank you for your overwhelming excitement. All right. Now, so there's the natural man. Talked a little bit about that. Now, let's deal with the carnal man because this is another one that we need. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us today. I apologize not being able to finish this lesson. I'm telling you, there's so much that you can learn by simply getting the CD right now, absolutely free. All you have to do is call the number on the screen right now. Operators are waiting on your phone call. They're going to send it out to you absolutely free, no cost to you whatsoever. Now, this will not be available. The free offer is not available on our website and either at our store as well at our resource store. You must call the number on the screen in order to get it free. Yes, you can call the number on the screen and you can get that out, sent out to you absolutely free. Now, I want to pray for you right now. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, today is your day to receive Christ. Can you say this prayer along with me right now? Say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, known and unknown. I renounce them all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. Well, if you said that prayer, 
I want to send you out some free literature that's going to help you grow. I want to send you out a disciple manual. I'm going to send you out a daily bread. I'm going to also send you out a CD that you can listen to and you can grow because I tell you, it will change your life. All of this is absolutely free, but I need you to do something for me. I need you to call the number on the screen. The operators will call you back or send this out to you absolutely free. It's going to be a blessing to you. So I uh, want to make, you, make sure you do that. Look at the number on the screen. Call right now. Now, if you desire to, uh, to, to find a church home or to locate a church where you can get to talk the word of God, we'll help you in that area too. All you have to do on that is go to our website. Once you go to our website, go to the comment section on our website. Then begin to put your name and address and where you're from. Say you're looking for a church in your area. And then we'll send you out some churches that we can recommend. But in the meanwhile, we're going to be praying for you that you get into a Bible teaching church where you'll be able to grow. Now, if you ever in the Goose Creek, South Carolina area, Charleston area, won't you come and visit us here at New Life Christian Fellowship Church? I believe that you'll have an experience like never before. I truly believe that. Well, thank you so much for joining us in today's broadcast. I truly believe that your life has been impacted by the word of God. Remember now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you continually hear the word of God, the more you're going to grow in the things of the Lord. This is Pastor Dexter Easton of New Life Christian Fellowship Church telling you to experience new life. God bless. We look like insects in their eyes. But they didn't say in theirs. They said their own. See, how you look at yourself will determine. Will you multiply? Will you increase? Amen. Put your hand in front of your face. Act like it's a mirror. And say this with me. Say, hey, I'm wonderfully made in the image of God and his likeness. I have the mind of Christ. And I hold his thoughts. In his purposes, in my heart, in Jesus' name, amen. How to look at yourself. Call now for a free CD of today's broadcast. Dial 1-866-910-LIFE. That's 1-866-910-5433. Dr. Easley would like you to have this free CD. Also, don't forget Dr. Easley's offer to receive the Abundant Life series for a love offering of $20 or more. Call our phone representative at 866-910-5433 today to get this offer. We are waiting for your call. Visit our website at newlifegcsc.org where you'll find more series by Dr. Easley. We would like to invite you to connect with Dr. Easley on Twitter at Dr. Dexter Easley, on Facebook, facebook.com, NLCFGCSC, on YouTube. Dexter Easley Ministry and visit our website at newlifegcsc.org. Stay connected. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Preacher. Airways Church of God, located here at 601 Clayton Street. I want to specifically and purposely invite you to come and to be a part of what God is doing here at Rice Temple. I'm your pastor here, Bishop Gregory S. Cannon. 
you can come and join us at 9.30 a.m. for Sunday school and at 11 o'clock a.m. for our morning worship. And each Sunday night, first, third, and fifth Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Also, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. is our intercessory prayer hour, and at 7 o'clock is our Bible study. We want to invite you to come and bring your children, because at 7 o'clock each Wednesday, we also have what we call YPLJ, Young People Love and Joy Band, where our young people are taught the Word of God, and that we share with them in their own setting. So we want to invite you to come to be with us here at Rice Temple. You can reach us by telephone at 334-262-8452. God bless you. Come be with us. invite you to stay tuned for the next one hour for what God is going to do in this service. We thank God for you watching us here and we want you to tune in because God is doing marvelous things and we want to invite you to come to Rice Temple and enjoy a live service. Daniel chapter 3 and verses 12 through 18. If you'll stand to your feet when you get it. Daniel 3 and 12. We may read just a few minutes, but all right, everybody ought to be standing. And the word declared, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. Now, if you note, I'm jumping right into somewhat the middle of a text to go where I want to go. By the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then they brought them, these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready at what time ye hear the sound of the coronet, the fruit, the harp, the sackbut, the psalter, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made. And well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is this God that shall deliver you out? of my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And if you drop down to verse 28, 
and, it was, and 29 and 30, and then we'll be through reading. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake, this is after the furnace, and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have sent his angels to deliver his servant that trust in him, and have changed the king's word, and yield their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which say anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sword. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Somebody say amen. amen. You might be seated. I want you to get me Roman 8 and 35 and hold it. I'll be there somewhere down the line. I, I want to deal with this thought. I was uh, praying yesterday and afternoon and, and, and last night. I said, Lord, what in the world? do I need to say to the people? Because I, I never want preaching to be just another tuned-up, hollering sound. There needs to be some substance in order for you to grow in God. There needs to be something in the message that will help you to know whether you're on the right track or not. Now, every message may not make you feel good. It may not tickle your ears. It may not give you your... Uh, destination point on this journey, but it'll at least let you know where you stand. And I want to deal with this message from this angle because I notice, and we have preached this so much, and everybody like to preach about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they went in the fire, but I, I saw something in these boys, the reason they were so committed to what they were doing. You know, you can be truly committed to the thing and truly wrong in a thing. Because you got some people that are committed to things, but they are deadly wrong in what they are committed to. You got some people got their mind wrapped up in certain ways of how they're going to do things, but they're just as sincerely wrong. So you can be sincerely right and wrong. But I noticed something in these three young men. These were young men that had been taken captive in Babylon because they had disobeyed the nation of Israel, had disobeyed God to the degree that now God is bringing chastisement upon them. And in their chastisement, uh, God did not put them in a chokehold and not allow them to be blessed. How many of y'all know some situation God gets you in, he will still bless you while you are in it? Because there's something God not going to get you out until he get ready to get you out. It, it don't matter how much crying, how much praying, and how much rolling you do when God get ready, he's going to get you out. But what I saw in these young men was a determination. They were determined that no matter what Nebuchadnezzar said, they would serve no other God. So I want to deal with the subject today, the reward of determination. Because too many people are giving up and quitting now. They are saying, I'm tired of what I'm having to put up with, and I don't have to put up with all of that. But I, I thought that too, but I learned that there are some things that you have to put up with when you are determined to follow God. You, you know, a lot of things in life we commit ourselves to, even on your job, when you committed yourself that I'm going to stay here till I retire. I'm going to stay here and get all of my benefits. Y'all ain't going to work with me here. You can put it in your mind. Nobody's going to run me off my job. And nobody's going to treat me where I'm going to leave because I got a retirement. I got benefits. And that sounds like determination to me. You are determined that nothing will stop you. Well, I wonder why is it then that when it comes to the church that we are so easily moved out of God. 
There are times when God sent us through a certain situation that we lose our determination because of the pressure and the, the pain that we have to deal with. But I don't know whether you understand it or not, but this way is full of pressure and pain. If you live right, you're going to go through some stuff. Amen. I believe with the Bible that declared that any man that will live godly, he shall suffer persecution. There's no way around it. The only way to get out of it is to go through it. See, something we telling God, oh, God, I want out. I don't want to have to deal with this. I told him that too. But God knew that the thing that I'm trying to get out is the thing that's going to develop me and make me what I ought to be. See, see, some stuff you dealing with, it's not because God just want to see you cry or he want to see you hurt. He's trying to take stuff out of you. I understand that many things that God has put us into is more for your good than for your demise. He's trying to build you. He's trying to make you. He's trying to purge your life. Something we got in us, God needs to get out of us. Hello, somebody. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, instead of us reading Psalm 23 all the time, maybe you ought to go to Psalm 51 and be like David. David said in Psalm 51, after he had messed up against uh, Uriah and Bathsheba, he began to cry to God and said, Lord, have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness and thy tender mercy. And he said, blot out my transgression." Why is that necessary, Bishop? Because I read one place in the scripture where the Lord said in that day, he said, many are going to cry and say, we prophesied in your name. And we cast out devils in your name. But Jesus said, you did it all, but I never knew you. Why you don't didn't know us, Lord? He said, because what you did, your work was in iniquity. So rather than reading Psalm 23, trying to encourage yourself that the Lord is my shepherd, you ought to be saying, Lord, look on my life, and if there's anything in here that's not like you, I need you to get that out of me. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, to me, have been through that process. And the reason I say they'd been through it because they had reached a point of determination. See, when you go through enough stuff, you get determined that nothing else is going to stop me. I even had a lady tell me one time she had dealt with men that used to jump on and beat her. She said, I'm determined the next man hit me, he's going to have to die. I said, well, sir. She had a determination she wasn't going to be beat no more. See, when you get tired of being beaten up by the devil, there ought to be a determination. We not fight no more, devil. I believe even the scripture said that the kingdom suffer violence and the violence taking it by force. When you get tired of the devil punching on you and knocking on you and lying to you and selling you with tickets, you ought to get to a place and be determined that I will buy no more. See... We're living in a time where people are so easy to quit now. Giving up on life. Suicide rate is higher than it ever been. People are special among young people. Why? Because they have no determination. Even when they're young, they don't even know what life is. But somehow, the enemy have planted a seed that checking out is better than going through. I got news for you, suicide is a permanent answer to a temporary situation. Because once you're dead, you can't come back and refix the thing. Once you kill yourself, you're out of here. No more remedy for your problem. But if you hang out a little while, God will bring you through. I read over there when David said, weeping may endure for me, but he said, joy comes in the morning. If you learn how to hang out with God for a little while, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with, he'll bring you out of the thing. The testimony of these three young men 
that was taken in captive in Babylon, uh, they were not dog catchers and street sweepers. They were not put in position uh, to clean up this highway, but God blessed them to rise to places among those that was in authority. King Nebuchadnezzar found grace in their eyes and he placed them in the hierarchy of his uh, government. See, sometimes when you're going through, God puts you there because he's trying to promote you. Some of y'all trying to promote yourself. Self-promotion will never last. You got to go through some stuff. And then going through, you got to be determined. It's not about the promotion that's at the end of this, but it's about me going through. It's about me not dying where I am. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they realized they were in a terrible position, but they understood who they were worshiping. They realized that we are serving the only God, the God that declared in here to Israel in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. He said, Here, O Israel. Israel, the Lord our God is one. They said, we are serving the one God. And we refuse to serve another God. See what's going on in our society and in the world today. We are choosing to worship and serve other gods because your God didn't move fast enough. And I got news for you. God don't move on your time. He moves when he gets ready. Because if God moved every time that we said move God, some of us would really be in a mess. Oh, yes, if he would move every time you said, God, I need you to do something, you probably wouldn't have been as strong as you are now. Something taught you how to be strong. Something taught you perseverance. It taught you how to wait on God. When God sent you through a dilemma, he's teaching you patience. He's teaching you endurance. He's teaching you how to hold on when nobody else is encouraging you. See, you, you know, when you have determination, uh, it brings on some things in your life. First of all, to be determined means to be firm in your purpose. You got to know your purpose. You got to understand, why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I here? Why did God leave me here? Some of you are 60, 70, and even in your 80, you ought to ask yourself, why am I here? I got news for you. There's a reason why you're here. God didn't leave you here just to occupy space and time, but you got something. You got a treasure that's been hidden down in your life. He said, I call the young because they're strong, the old because they know the way. There are some of you that know the way, but you refuse to tell it because you said this generation don't want to hear what I got to say. Tell it anyhow. Sometimes, as a preacher, I know folk don't want to hear everything we got to say because everything God sent out is not always good. Come on, talk with me. When I say good, it's not always what you want to hear. Sometimes when God sent the prophet in the Old Testament, they didn't want to see the prophet because they were unaware of what he had to say. Many times when the prophet entered the city, first thing they would ask the prophet is not what you got from me, what word the Lord gave you. See, old prophets are not like these modern day prophets. Because these modern day prophets, every time you run up to them, they got a word for you. You're going to get a house, you're going to get a car, you're going to get that man. God's going to give you that wife you want. Hello, somebody. But in the Old Testament, when the prophet showed up, they asked the prophet, is all well. In other words, is God all right with us? Are we, have we upset at God? See, they were understanding that when God sent the prophet, he sent him because he had a word. Not because he was trying to buff their ego or pop them up or pump them up. God had a word. Sometimes when God sends a man of God, the woman of God, it's not because he's trying to make you feel good, pump you up, lift you up. Sometimes he's got to dig deep and uproot you a little bit. Yeah. Told the prophet Isaiah, cry loud, spare not, <laughs> lift up your voice like a trumpet. What am I going to say, Lord? He says, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob. 
their sin. Oh, no, no, Isaiah didn't have a wonderful message. He didn't have a message of, glo of, of glory and hallelujah and lifting your hands and praising God. He had a message that was sending them home, looking at themselves and crying and begging God, what is it that I need to do, Lord? Hallelujah. But when I look at my text, and let me go to that. I'm almost done if y'all don't know it. When you understand your purpose, you ought to get determined, fixed in your mind, that nobody's going to stop me. Because I got news for you. If you're going to run for Jesus, you need a determination. You need a, a, a root down inside of you that will lock you in play, that will feed you in drought and time of starvation. Because you know, when people, you're not doing what they want you to do, they have the tendency to want to starve you out. One preacher told me, he said, folk told him he was sent to pastor a church. And the preacher, the folks that had been before him, either were jelly back or didn't have no determination. Because see, they told him, say, we've been known to stop preachers. In other words, we've been known to control them. If we don't preach what we want, we'll... You know, put a stop to that mess he's talking about. But see, what you got to be determined here, you got to be determined, I will cry whether they like it or not. And he said the first Sunday he pastored that church and they told him what they, we known to break preacher. He was so determined they wasn't going to break him, he turned 25 out on one Sunday. <laughs> and all of them were just kinfolk. Some of y'all don't realize when you get determined, you got to put some folk out your life. You got to put some folk out of your path that's walking with you. I know that's your homeboy. I know, you know, he's your home slicer. You know, you know what y'all call him now. I don't know what they call him now, but you know, your skillet, okay. Uh-huh, he's your home skillet. But I got news for you. Them young people will help me with service over there. Tell me, Bishop, we don't talk like that no more. But I don't care what he is to you when you get a determination that you want your life to be right before God. There are some people that got to exit your life in order for God to make an entrance. There are some things in your way right now. The reason you haven't reached the plateau of your blessing and your favor with God because there are some things and people that need to get out of the way. Shat, right, Meshach and Abednego, the, the king had done everything in his power to kill their determination, but they were determined to serve God anyhow. Yes, what did he do to them, Bishop Cannon? First of all, he brought them in a strange land. And when they came into the land of Babylon, he took away their worship. He tried to change their God. He even made them eunuchs, meaning that he had taken away their manhood and made them in a position that they were not even desirous of another person. But they were determined to worship God. See, sometimes in serving God, there are people that try to take stuff away from you. They try to kill your mentality. They try to work on your mind and get you all broke down in your mind. That's why some people tell you, don't nobody want you but me. The devil lives a lie there, tell you. You done got to be a 16. I remember when you were nothing but a 6, but now you are 16. I got news for you. Don't worry. Somebody love them 16. But see, you know, it's all about men. They'll tell you how you used to be a six, and now you are 16. But he don't talk about when he used to be a 32, and now he's a 48. You got to be determined. You can't mess with my psyche. You can't mess with my mind. You can say what you want to say, but I'm determined yes, that I'm going through it anyhow. Who glory. Oh, Lord, I'm messing. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to take my time. Huh? Sometimes there are demonic forces that are assigned to your life to tear you down. 
He'll tell you how many times you've been married and divorced and how many times you've been, you know, put out and how many times folk didn't like you, how many folk done quit you and left you alone and how many times you've been up in the house by yourself. But you got to tell yourself in your own mind that I'm determined I'm going to make it in the house. If I have to make it by myself, you don't need all them folk. Sometimes you dragging along folk that's going to kill your destiny. You dragging folk along that's going to bless, that's up your blessing. There's some people designed to mess you up. They're just like old leech. they blood suckers. <laughs> Help me somebody. Some of y'all got some blood suckers in your life. You need to get rid of them, pull them off, set them on fire, burn them, throw them in the garbage, do whatever you got to do to them. But get rid of that blood sucker. They sucking the life out of you. Every time you look like you're going up, they pull you back down. Every time you feel like you're going to make it, they go to messing with your mind. And you start to feel depressed and down and out. Honey, you don't need that man. You don't need that woman. You don't need that individual in your life. Because God got a destiny for you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. Come on, somebody. He said, I got thoughts that I'm going to bring you to an expected end. See, God mind for your life is not what your buddy mind for your life. Because, you know, there's some people tell you, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you to the end where they, where they are now. They gone. Them same folk that told you, I love you forever. You the apple of my eye. You the sweetness in my coffee. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me, somebody. Your coffee dog ain't got no sugar. Not even sweet and low. Because they gone. They left you. They abandoned you. But the Lord is always on your side. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were determined because when everybody else fell there, when everybody else left there, it was the Lord that was on their side. Oh, God. I feel like preaching in here. It was the Lord. See, that's why I don't get what nobody said. I'm not going to abandon God. Come on here. Y'all talking about you run too much, you go too much, but you got to understand it's the Lord that keeps me up. Broadcast, we really hope that you were blessed today by the word of God. We want you to come and join us in a live service. I hope if this service today has been a blessing to you and to yours that you will write us and let us know that you were blessed by the word of God, that you were blessed by the anointing that was falling in the worship service. And you also can obtain a copy of this service of today by writing us at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. If you'd like to receive a copy of this service today, you can have it on CD or DVD. Just write us here at Rice Temple at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. And include a donation to help us to continue this broadcast. God has been blessing souls in our service. Come be in a live service and experience the powerful move of God that's on this ministry. I believe that God is moving for such a time as this. We realize that there are crises all over the land. But come and share in here at Rice Temple, AOH Church of God with us. I'm your pastor here, Bishop Gregory S. Cannon. God bless you. Until next week this time, you be blessed of the Lord. And remember... There is a word from the Lord.
You're tuned in to Life Television Network, your number one Christian station. this morning to um, John the first chapter <clears throat> and we're going to be talking about words faith and things say it with me words faith and things John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, or prevailed not against it. Then we skip down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Father, we thank you for the anointing upon your Word, that it shall be manifest in the lives of every believer that hears and understands this Word. And we thank you for it. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all that shall be accomplished. And everybody said, Amen. Now, notice the Scripture says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, over the years, you know, I've heard people say some things about the Word of Faith message, you know. You hear people say, well, you know, there's more to the Bible than faith. Well, certainly there is. But have you noticed that none of it will work without faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because what God has given to us the promises he's given us in his word, you enter into them by faith through the grace of God. It is only through faith that we have access into the grace of God. And it is the grace of God that causes the reality of the promise in our lives. But now here we have a, a profound scripture that sometimes we just read over it and kind of say, yeah, I know that's in the Bible. But let's read it again. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was the Word. All things began with words. Now, if you read Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice that it says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. It gets almost monotonous before we get through Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I think 10 times in Genesis 1 it says, and God said. And I was thinking about that one day, and I said, now, Lord, why, you know, why did you say, repeat that over and over? And, you know, it looked like a shortcut wouldn't just say, God said, and then list all the things God said. But he's trying to get over to us what caused creation, words. Remember, he looked out, and he saw darkness, and he said, light be, and light was. In other words, he called light out of darkness. It began with words. The power, the life and the power of words is something that, that we really haven't understood over the years, but, but we're learning to, to dig into some of these things and see what causes things to happen. You notice it says all things were made by him. Him who? Him the word. Now, see, if we skip over here to verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Do you realize what he's saying here? In the beginning was the Word, the Word with God. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus was the Word of God. He was the personification of the Word of God. He was the exact expression of God himself. And the Word was made flesh, took flesh upon itself and dwelt among us. Now, how did that happen? You read the story in, in, the, uh, in Luke, the first chapter that the angel appeared to Mary and said, you'll conceive and bear a child. She said, how, seeing I know not a man? 
Now, see, the, she, she was not in unbelief. You know, doubts, that you can have legal doubts. See, when you just don't know, that's a legal doubt. You just need more information. But when you know what the Word said, then won't believe it. That's not doubt. That's unbelief. Nothing legal about that. <laughs> but she said, How, seeing I know not a man, said the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee, and that a holy child should be more of these because be called the Son of God. She said, Be it unto me. Now listen to what she said. Be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, she said, You found a woman that'll believe you. What if she just said, Well, no, I don't believe that. God had to find another woman. She said, Be it unto me according to your word. She received the word of God by the angel. She left there and went right to her cousin's house and said, He has done great things for me. What evidence did she have? Nothing but the Word. She believed it. She received it. She conceived the Word in her spirit. It manifests itself in her physical body. In the beginning was the Word. All things begin with words. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl there, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing. Well, now, how are them going to have dominion? <laughs> the same way that him had dominion. I know that's not good English, but it'll help you understand it if you pull those words back in there. Through faith-filled words. When God looked out and saw darkness, see, you only get two verses into Genesis. You see God calling things that are not as though they were. Now, we're going to get into that tonight. Don't miss tonight. Because we're going to go through the Scriptures and show you some, under, some, some places in the Scriptures where that the profound principle of the Bible has been overlooked by many, many down through the years. It's called the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. Been small wars fought over faith and confession. You know, somebody said, well, if you say it, anything other than what is in reality, you just lie. No, you're calling for what is not. Calling for what the Word promised but is not yet manifest. And, and I got to get off of that because I'll get sidetracked. But, but don't miss tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, here we see that all things were made by words. Now, Jesus was a personification of the Word of God. And in the book of Colossians, it reveals that he upholds all things. Now, turn with me there, if you will, to Colossians, the first chapter. Because as you tie these together, it helps you understand it. Now, in Matthew's gospel, the, the, while you turn into Colossians, in Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter, Jesus said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, and notice the phrase, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches away that which was sown in his heart. Now, Mark's Gospel records it a little different, because Mark failed to pick up on what Matthew caught in that phrase, understandeth it not. Mark said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, then cometh the wicked one, and takes away that which was sown in his heart. Now, if that was the truth, the whole truth, then there wouldn't be much need to hear it, would it? Because Satan would just steal it from you. But you see, Matthew caught something that, that really gives understanding to it. If you don't understand it, the enemy will steal it from you. But if you understand it, he can't steal it from you. I mean, when you understand it and put it in motion in your life, it changes your life. That's why we need to understand every aspect of it. Colossians chapter 1, we'd like to read nearly this whole first chapter, but for the sake of time, uh, let's start with verse 13. Now, back up 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, are able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. God hath delivered us. Say it. God hath delivered me from the power of darkness. Now, that word power there, I believe you'll find that it's the Greek word that means ability of darkness, because the, the 
uh, power, uh, darkness has no authority at all. It's the ability, and that ability is deception. He has delivered us from the ability of darkness and then translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. Now, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every cre creature. For by him were all things created. By him who? Him, Jesus, of the Word of God. Now remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and the Word created all things. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible, invisible, whether there be thrones, principalities, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. So the creation, all creation, began with words. From Genesis all through the scriptures you find it. God looked out and saw darkness and said, Light be, let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. Now, God produced everything, produced is after his kind. And God created man in his own image, his own likeness. So he expected us to operate in the same principles of the Bible. The power of words are awesome. The greatest power on earth is the power of God's word. And it's never lost any power. It's just as powerful as it was when God spoke it. The problem is, so many times, instead of letting the word abide in us, remember what Jesus said? In John uh, uh, 15, verse 17, he said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, say what you will, declare what you will, pray what you will, and it shall be done. Now, I'm paraphrasing this. We take, you have to take more scriptures to get all of that in there. But you see, if you incorporate the teaching of Jesus... Concerning that, that's all in there. Matthew 21, 22, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. In other words, you're only limited to what you can believe based on the authority of the Word of God. In other words, if you can find it in the Word of God, there's enough faith in that Scripture to cause it to be manifest in your life. So you're only limited to what you can believe based on the authority of that Word. Mark 11:24. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So we're talking about words, faith, and things. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them. Now, if God didn't want you to have things that he had given you, why didn't he tell you how to get them? The things God has given us. Second Peter chapter 1 tells us he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises, these words, you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, you don't have to be, but you could be. You might be. If you, if you take hold of that word. Now, Mary received the word of God. She believed it. She received it in her spirit. She went, the first thing she did was go and tell her cousin that God has done great things for me. That word manifests itself in her body, and we read here where it says, and the word was made flesh, and the word took upon itself flesh and dwelt among us. God's word produces after his kind. Now let's go over to a scripture that's very familiar with us. Hebrews chapter 11. And I know sometimes we think, well, we've got everything that's in there, but we might find something there that's interesting. Where Paul says, Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What did Mary hope for? She hoped for what God had said and given to her. 
Now, hope, you see, is out in the future. But you see, that word produced faith. When she began to say what God said to her, faith cometh to hear. Now, the Apostle Paul says, tells us in the 10th chapter of Romans, he says, the word is nigh thee. Now, listen to what he says. The word is nigh you or near to you. As his, in other words, it's as close to you as getting it in your mouth and speaking it into your heart. Now, I'm paraphrasing it. That's for uh, that's St. Charles' translation. <laughs> The word is nigh you. It's first in your mouth, then it gets in your heart. And when Mary heard the word that came from God by the angel, she first said, How, seeing I know not a man? But when, when he explained it to her, she said, Be it unto me according to the word of God. She said it with her mouth. She heard it with her ears. Now, we really have two sets of ears. Do you know that? We have the outer ear and the inner ear. And we have the middle ear, but we're talking about two of them. The inner ear is made up by bone structure inside the head. And the words that you speak are picked up by the inner ear and fed directly into what the Bible calls the heart, not the blood pump, the core, the center of your being. It's what motivates you. The word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Then in Romans 10, 17, Paul said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, in the preceding verses there, he said, the word is nigh you, it is in your mouth, and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which, which I preach. In other words, it's not in your neighbor's mouth and in your heart. He didn't even say it's in your pastor's mouth and in your heart. He said it's in your mouth and in your heart. Now, there's something there that we, we've missed, I think, because... Uh, it's true you can get some faith and certainly some knowledge from hearing what your pastor says or what I say from the Word of God, but there's something that changes you when you start saying what God said. It's the beginning of a miracle to get the Word of God, the promise of God, manifest in your life. Now, if you remember how Jesus taught, he always talked about things that people understood talked about sowing seed and reaping harvest, the parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. So it's obvious that the word of God is the seed, and the way you sow it is by saying it, because he said the kingdom of God is if a man cast a seed into the ground, and it should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. You don't really have to know exactly how it does it. You just know what he said to do and do it. You remember at the marriage of Cain of Galilee, <laughs> Mary, the mother of Jesus, preached one of the most profound sermons in the Bible. They said, we're out of wine. And she told Jesus. And then she said to the disciples, or to the, yes, the disciples, says, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She did learn one thing, that he knew what he was doing. And he was anointed to do what he was doing. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, folks, there's a sermon in that that I don't have time to preach this morning. But whatever Jesus said in the Word of God, just simply do it. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, remember Jesus talking in Mark eleven twenty three. Now, the, the, the beginning of that story was that he was hungry and he saw a fig tree fall off and he walked over there to, to, to get some figs. And there was no figs on it. And see, in Israel, they tell me that, that when a tree uh, had its leaves year round, it usually bore fruit year round. And, and he said, nobody will eat fruit from there hereafter forever. And he said it loud enough that the disciples heard it. Words. What well, we're talking about words, faith, and things. How words change things. Faith filled words changes things. Well, the tree withered and died, and they came back by the next day, and they asked him about it, and he said, uh, have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith? He said, verily I say unto you, or verily, verily, truly, truly I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now he starts talking about a mountain. 
Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, now listen to it, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Didn't say he'd have what he prayed. He said he'd have what he said. Now there's a truth there that sometimes we've skipped over. Your saying can nullify your praying if you don't keep your saying in line with what you pray. Three times he says say in those scriptures and one time believe. You have to preach more on the saying than you do the believing. Because so many times people believe all right, but they don't say anything. Now you have to realize that, that the hearing of the word generates faith. And I'm going to show you why and, and how it does that in a little bit. We're talking about that just a little bit. But he said, whosoever shall say. Now somebody said, who will that work for? Somebody said, it'll work for whosoever. No, it won't just work for whosoever. It only works for whosoever dares to say and believe and doubt not in his heart and believe what he's saying will come to pass. Now, I'm glad he said doubt not in your heart because, you see, if he said doubt not in your head, there'd been no mountain smooth in this life because you can't believe your head what you can believe with your heart. But when you start saying what God said in his word until it causes faith to come, and it bides in you, then you can believe things with your heart or your spirit you can't believe with your head. In fact, your head will give you trouble a lot of times over what you know on the inside. Remember, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done. Pray what you will, it shall be done. You can decree what you will, it shall be done. Job said, decree a thing and it shall be established to you. The things you decree and speak with your mouth establishes it to you. It's what puts it on the inside of you. That's why Jesus said it must abide in you. It's not enough just to know what he said. It has to be on the inside of you until you believe more in what the word said than what you see with your natural eye. The word is nigh you, Paul said. It's in your mouth and in your heart. The more you say it, the more you believe it. Words is what determines what you believe, whether it's written word or whether it's spoken word. But the spoken word seems to be more powerful. Now, remember, just, you know, when you were going to school or when I was going to school anyway, they had us quote the multiplication tables over and over and over until we knew them by heart. They knew back then that what you say long enough will get in you. And then you don't have to, you know, get your pencil out or, or get your oranges out and apples and count them to, to do multiplication because it's in you, it abides in you. But so many times people know what the Word said well, yeah, I know the Bible said give and it shall be given unto you, but, but I gave and here's what happened to me. And they cast out the word in favor of first experience 4-7. <laughs> now, that's a dangerous thing to do. But the word said give and it shall be given unto you. Yeah, but my car broke down when I gave more. Yeah, Satan came to steal the word. And if he can get that word out of you, and if he can get you off the word, see, don't cast out the word in favor of experience. Stay with the word of God, regardless of what happens to you in life that never changes the word of God. The word still says the same thing. But if you'll say what God said in his word concerning the circumstances of life, eventually it will change what happens to you and you'll live out the reality of the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Well, we're talking about words, faith, and things. God's Word gets in your heart and produces faith for the things that God has given you. Now, the way that gets in your heart, it's in your mouth, and then it's in your heart. The Word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. 
Now, let's go over to, to Romans, the third chapter. Let's talk a little bit about the law of faith. Faith is a law. Paul talked about faith being a law. I'm glad you could join us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast today. Now, before we leave the broadcast, I have a tape offer this week that I'm excited about. Uh, we, we've talked about words, faith, and things. Now, we have a two-tape series that's called Words, Faith, and Things. A uh, two-tape album. Uh, it's, it's called Offer Number 2251, and it's $12 plus $3 postage and handling, total of $15. Offer number 